just a few days ago, the Biden administration, they exchanged, they did a prisoner exchange with the Russians. And of course, it's very interesting because it's going, it's going on right in the middle of the war with Ukraine, right? And the Russians had a former U.S. Marine named Trevor Reed. They exchanged him for uh, Konstantin Yeroshenko, who was a Russian pilot in the United States. And I interviewed Yeroshenko just a few days after he came out of prison. Um, and the, uh, the full interview is right here on the channel. It's one of the, I think it's the first interview he did uh, after coming out, at least in English. And uh, it's mind boggling because this guy was kidnapped. Not extradited, he was kidnapped by U.S. agents. And I'm going to run you through his whole case right now. And this is, this is really mind-blowing because I want you to understand something. You know, uh, I'm, I'm one of the only journalists covering Julian Assange's case, right? And that case is very important because it, it threatens press freedoms. The United States is basically charging him as a spy and threatening him with 175 years, which is outrageous, just because he published evidence of U.S. war crimes. And something that I've come to realize as I've covered David Mendoza's case, um, uh, which was cited by Assange's lawyers, and Yeroshenko's case, it, I've realized is that when it comes to the United States, taking Assange, who again has never lived in the US, never worked in the US, he's Australian in the UK, and yet they're dragging him to the US. This is normal. This is standard procedure. They have done this to so many people, you have no idea. And in that regard, it's ironic because Assange's case is actually really not special. It's, it's extremely special in terms of the threat to press freedoms, yes. But I'm going to show you here how the United States, they break international law, they break law in multiple jurisdictions, and they, they manufacture jurisdiction. It, it's frankly mind-boggling. So. When it comes to Yurishenko, here's the prisoner exchange, just so you can see him uh, coming out of the plane, and uh, this is with his family. So, again, uh, that's Trevor Reed right now coming out with the, with the duffel bag. And, um, and that's Yurishenko, Konstantin Yurishenko. So, he, he hadn't seen his family in 12 years. And this is what happened. So Yeroshenko was set up by the DEA in Liberia, okay? And at the time, he could barely speak English. He was in a room with three DEA agents. And they basically did something which is called manufacturing jurisdiction. The United States has nothing to do uh, with this story, but the, the agents made sure that it did so they could justify uh, bringing him to the U.S. So what they were accusing him of in court is that he was trying to transport cocaine uh, uh, to the United States. That's not what happened. They told him merchandise, merchandise, and he didn't understand what that was. And they, they told him it's going to be with diplomatic um, uh, luggage. You can't search that, of course. And they asked him, can you do that? And he said, yeah, yeah, sure, no problem. And the idea was that he would fly between Liberia and South America. Nothing to do with the U.S. at all. And again, he's in the room with three DEA agents. One DEA agent says to the other guy in the back of the room that he's going to take his share from this deal, which is a bunch of cocaine, to the U.S. That's it. That's, that's all it took to include the United States in this case and to justify kidnapping him. So he, he doesn't even understand that they're talking about cocaine. They said merchandise. And he wasn't even planning on flying to the United States. Is flying between South America and Liberia. The DEA agents made up this crime, and that's, that's all it took. They gave him 20 goddamn years. And the way that they did this is so insidious because they not only kidnapped him, they tortured him as well. And I, and I'm, I have the proof for that right here. So this, this conversation that I just told you about was in Ukraine. In Ukraine, you are not allowed to film someone uh, or record them uh, without their knowledge and certainly not to use it in court. It's against the Constitution. Those DEA agents broke that law by filming Yeroshenko without his knowledge and then using that in court. 
And the other thing is, the DEA did not even tell the Ukrainian authorities that they are running a sting operation in Ukra on Ukrainian soil. Which is, I mean, this is ridiculous. You, you can't just go to another country, even if you're DEA, and start running operations. You have to tell the government there, right? You need to get permission because it's another country. And I have the proof for that. I have the document right here. This is from the Office of the Prosecutor General of Ukraine, okay? And look what they say right here. They say here that I confirm that the competent authorities of Ukraine have not given permission to the Drug Enforcement Administration of the United States of America, either in 2009 or in 2010, to conduct an investigation as to the matter involving uh, Konstantin Yeroshenko. The law enforcement authorities of Ukraine have not received any requests and were not notified to that effect that the investigative agencies of the, US, of the USA conducted a special operation in the territory of Ukraine in December 2009 and March 2010 relative to the matter of Konstantin Yeroshenko. So, number one, you can see they've broken Ukrainian law. Okay, they've broken the law in Ukrainian jurisdiction. Now, the next thing that happens... This is their so-called evidence, right? They kidnap Yeroshenko from Liberia. So this is uh, Yeroshenko's sworn testimony. And again, you don't have to take his word for it. I'll show you the, the corroborating evidence afterwards. But let's, let's just look at what he said. And this is his sworn testimony, okay? So he says on May 28th, 2010... I was abducted from the Royal Hotel in Monrovia, in Liberia. I was standing in the parking lot of the hotel. The driver of the Nissan with tinted windows waved at me. And when I approached the car, some men grabbed me and pushed me into the car. They put a cap over my face and pressed so hard, I could not move. Um, in approximately one hour, the car stopped and the guards dragged me into the building. As we entered the room, I saw about 10 people. They asked me some questions about some people that they thought I, I knew, and also asked generally about what was happening in Guinea and, and Mali. The guards took away my Russian Orthodox icons, so his, his crucifix, necklace, or so on, yeah. Uh, they swore and threw them in the garbage. They commanded me to take off all my clothes. At first, I only took off my shirt, but the guard told me to take everything off. Then they put shackles and handcuffs on me and tightened them very hard, instantly putting me in pain and restricting my blood circulation. The handcuffs were connected with a chain so I could not stand straight because the chain was very short. From the first moments of abduction, I was trying to find out what was wrong, tell them I'm a foreign national. I asked for permission to contact my family or the Russian consulate. But every time I was trying to speak, they punched me, kicked me, and hit me with the rubber truncheon in the stomach, head, genitals, and legs, and commanded silence. The beatings were followed by coarse expressions regarding my family, my country, and me. They told me they would rape and kill my wife and kill my child. Uh, they drag him then into another room, and they, he says, I could see metal hooks, bats, ropes, metal sticks, metal wire in the cabinet. Uh, there were two metal hooks on the wall for clipping handcuffs onto one wall. The hooks were located much higher than an average person's height and were open arms length apart. So basically, they, they put him in an extremely uncomfortable position, right? And they started to beat him in the stomach. Uh, kicked him in the shins every time I tried to he says every time I tried to curl to protect my internal organs They beat me in the genitals area from the back. It lasted for hours uh, They threatened me with a hunting knife One of them grabbed me by the hair from the back and placed the knife to my throat They made obscene movements imitating sexual intercourse every my every slightest attempt to move or say anything was stopped by more abuse one guard put a nylon rope around my neck and pulled from the back until I could not breathe. The abuse and beatings continued until I lost my consciousness. So this went on for days, okay? You, you get the idea. This, this went on for days. Um, and here, look what happens next. They take him to the United States, okay? Now, under Liberian law, uh, if you are kicked out of the country, you're expelled as, as an illegal alien or whatever other reason, there's a process, okay? And here's where it gets very weird, because uh, when the United States took Yeroshenko from Liberia, he had an expulsion order, right? So basically, on paper, the, Lib the Liberian government expelled him from Liberia. How, how on earth did they expel him 
when he never had this process. This is what the law says, okay? So, the sole and exclusive procedure for determining the deportability of an alien requires a hearing by special hearing officer and a record made in a proceeding before a specially designated hearing officer. So the alien shall have reasonable opportunity to be present at the hearing. Um, and uh, you, you see they're setting out all the guidelines that basically you can be there in person. Uh, you have to be there in person unless there's another reason. And uh, the alien shall be given notice uh, of the charges against them and where the proceeding will be held. And they will have a, a chance to examine the evidence and to present evidence on their own behalf. And it says here that the, the, the law provides for possible countries that an alien may be deported to. Okay? So the section offers the opportunity to the alien to designate one country that the minister can deport them to. So basically, if you're being kicked out of Liberia, you can tell them, please send me to this country. And then under the law, they have to go and check or they have to go and ask this country if they will accept you. Okay, and there's a time period of three months. And if that doesn't work, they can send you to your country of uh, citizenship. So in Yeroshenko's case, he's Russian. This entire procedure never happened. They, they kidnapped him, they tortured him, and mysteriously, there's an expulsion order signed. How, how, did, how was there an expulsion order signed when this process never happened? You have to have this procedure. Yeroshenko is a Russian citizen. Why didn't they deport him to Russia? He's never been to the United States in his life. Why? He, he didn't ask to go to the United States. Why did he go to the U.S.? Do you see how shady this is? This tells me that the Liberian government uh, was pressured by the United States. They're working together. The U.S. said, just give us this guy, and they just rubber stamped it and gave it to him. That's what that tells me. Now, how do we know that he's telling the truth, Yeroshenko, when he says he was tortured? I have, I'm not going to show you the names because I have their names and their photographs, their ID and signed sworn testimony. But I'm going to show you just two out of, there are several of these testimonies, just show you a couple of them, uh, of people that saw him being kidnapped. Okay? So this guy says they worked at the Royal Hotel in Monrovia for seven years as a, secu as a security officer. Um, the Americans came and gave me and my assistant $20 and told us to leave for 15 minutes. I witnessed that NSA agents came and took Mr. Yeroshenko from the parking lot. A bag was placed over his head, and he was beaten and put in, into a vehicle and taken away. Now, when they say NSA, I just want to be clear. They're, say, they're talking about the National Security Agency in uh, Liberia, not the one that you know with Edward Snowden in the United States, okay? Um, but basically, the Americans were working with the Liberian NSA, or National Security Agency. Here's another witness testimony. This person is saying... Um, Mr. Yeroshenko stayed at the Royal Hotel in May 2010. He was captured outside the hotel by American and NSA officers. The American officers uh, gave the order of his capture. A vehicle came to the hotel. He approached it, and a bag was placed over his head, and he was taken away. And there were two men that also stayed in the hotel at that time that watched uh, Yeroshenko's movements at all times. So, again, I, I have a couple more of these, but you, you get the idea. They all say the same, th same thing. They either saw him being kidnapped or one of them uh, was basically bribed to look the other way. So I don't need to take Yeroshenko's word for it. I have it right here. Now, this is another violation because under the Vienna Convention, when you arrest a foreign national, you have to tell their country that you've arrested them, especially if they ask you. So... Yeroshenko, you saw that as soon as he was, uh, he was kidnapped, he was telling them, I'm Russian, please contact my family or the embassy. What are you doing? Uh, the Americans never told the Russians that they had arrested a Russian national. Never. And you know what the excuse uh, was that they gave? Uh, this is, I'm not kidding. This is from Reuters. Look what they say. The United States blames facts for diplomatic gaffe over Russian. The United States has apologized to Russia for failing to give it prompt notice that a Russian citizen was in U.S. custody and blamed the error on an official hitting the wrong fax button. The notification went to Romania instead of Russia. <laughs> we pressed the wrong button on the fax machine, to be brutally honest. We have apologized to Russia. Yeah, you're really funny. <laughs> so... Make of that what you will, but I don't, I don't buy that for one second. I don't buy that for one second. 
And um, so you see so far, they've broken the Vienna Convention. They broke Ukrainian law. They broke Liberian law. Uh, and then they bring Yeroshenko to the United States. Okay. And they, they, they give him 20 year sentence. 20 year sentence for something that he did not do. Something that they framed him for when he couldn't even speak English. So just by being in the room. And that's something that they did. They manufactured the jurisdiction. Okay. And uh, there's a whole bunch of boring case law that I'm not going to get into. But, but uh, basically over time, they changed the laws that, you know, if, for example, you have no part in the, the conspiracy, it's really just the police that are setting you up. Um, then you couldn't be, be tried for it. But then they changed it to if, if you are involved in one prong of this whole affair, then you can be charged. And they're basically saying, well, you know, he was going to traffic uh, cocaine from South America to Liberia. And one part of this whole uh, thing, one prong was the DEA agent taking his share to the US. And so by like guilty by association, basically. Right. And I find this absolutely incredible that that uh, they do these things and can get away with this. You know, can you imagine if someone did that to to an American citizen? Can you imagine? L the lengths that they go to is, uh, I mean, it's extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. And um, of course, uh, I don't need to tell you that <laughs> this, uh, this also violates U.S. law, right? Because what they did here, they violated his right to due process. They fabricated evidence against him. And they, they treated him uh, in, in a manner that is, you can only describe as torture. And as far as, as far as I know, torture is illegal in almost every country. And it's definitely illegal uh, under international law. So we're talking about several international conventions, several legal jurisdictions. And this is normal. I need you to understand this. This is not an isolated incident. Th this stuff is normal. And this is why they're able to get away with things like Assange, like with Mendoza where they, they, they have so much power over other countries, uh, over their, their judiciaries, and they're immune from any sort of prosecution that they can get away with this stuff. It's really mind-boggling. It's absolutely mind-boggling. And uh, you should really go watch the interview that I did with him because uh, it, 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 it's... Uh, I'm speechless. I'm really speechless. Like, I had read this stuff. I, I was already familiar with the case but hearing him talk about it like you gotta imagine this guy was locked up for 12 years he literally just got out and is finally able to speak about this and uh yeah it's it's uh really 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 crazy here's another video of the exchange this is uh the other day when they're exchanging trevor reed for yaroshenko So that's something that he pointed out. Do you see how he's still in those prison slacks? Do you see how tiny his bag is? They didn't even let him take his case files with him. And meanwhile, if you look at the other video with Trevor Reed, this guy, he's not handcuffed. He's got his regular clothes. He's got an enormous duffel bag. Like, do you see the difference? Like, that's what Yaroshenko told me in the interview. Like, up until the last moment, they treated him like a terrorist. Like a terrorist. From, from the beginning with the, with the handcuffs, extremely tight right till the end you know it's uh it's really incredible and uh what it's frightening to me how, how so easily like you know they they don't even think twice about it they just ruin people's lives like this it, it's it's shocking really shocking and i want to say one thing because like let, let's let's say let's imagine for one second that the united states is telling the truth that this guy was really going to traffic cocaine Okay, let's let's pretend for one second that that's real. How does that excuse kidnapping him, torturing him, and and rendering him? How do, how can you excuse that? That that at this point the agents are bigger criminals than he is. They've broken four jurisdictions, laws in four jurisdictions: Ukrainian, Liberian, U.S., Russian, international. Uh, law like the Vienna Convention, the, the uh, Convention Against Torture. 
It's not even comparable at this point. And I want to say another thing. Um, the United States already had an extradition treaty with Liberia. If this guy's really a criminal, why didn't they just formally request uh, an extradition? I don't understand this. Why, why kidnap the guy? How do you excuse that behavior? They obviously knew where he was staying. They had guys tailing him. They already got the so-called evidence where he, he doesn't even speak English and he doesn't even know what they're talking about. They're talking to themselves. It, again, just to be clear, those DEA agents were talking amongst themselves, not to Yuroshenko, amongst themselves about bringing cocaine to the U.S. And they implicate him like that and ruin his life. And, and, and once again, uh, the United States had an extradition treaty with Liberia. Why didn't they extradite him formally? Formally. Instead of kidnapping and torturing him. You can't justify that. You can't justify it. It's, it's illegal. And it's a bigger crime than whatever they're accusing him of. And, and we know that it's fabricated. We know that it's fabricated. Unbelievable. So when I'm seeing things like this, I'm not surprised anymore. Like, uh, of, of course, of course they're taking Assange. Of course they took Mendoza. Of course. This is normal. And, and there are others, Mansour al Kassar. This is how they do. They have complete immunity. And they do this with complete impunity. Who's going to hold them accountable? No one's going to hold them accountable. They do whatever they like. Shocking. Really shocking. So, uh, again, I, I, I didn't cover every single thing about his case here. But uh, go watch the interview because it was me with Yeroshenko and with Mendoza. and. This is, uh, this is really ironic because Mendoza and Yeroshenko were cellmates in the United States four and a half years in the same cell. So they're like brothers, basically. And um, when I, as I told you, I'm covering the Assange case. And right now, the United States, they're giving these uh, promises, right? These assurances where they say, we promise we won't put Assange in solitary confinement or Sam's. Um, he can serve a sentence in Australia. He will get medical care. All these nice promises, right? Like, we'll treat him good. And the thing is, the United States has given promises like this before to Mendoza. And that's why, in court, Assange's lawyers brought up Mendoza's case. They said, look, they gave assurances to this guy as well, to Mendoza, and they lied. They broke their promise. And so I, uh, I published the documents from his case a few months ago, just to prove that you cannot trust these diplomatic assurances, because Mendoza was luckier than Assange. Mendoza didn't, didn't just get these assurances, he got a written, signed contract. Assange won't get that ever. I mean, it's very unlikely, is what I'm trying to say. And they still broke it. A written, signed contract by Spain, by the US, and himself. And they still broke it. And so the point is that I, I have the proof, the receipts, of the US State Department and the Department of Justice signing a contract about um, uh, prisoner transfers and extraditions and breaking it. And that means you cannot trust what uh, they are promising Assange, right? It's the proof. Because the whole idea is that you are taking the word of this country to treat this prisoner well, right? And how do you judge that? You look at their past behavior, and their past behavior is not good. And uh, that's very ironic that Yeroshenko and Mendoza were in the same cell. Really a uh, small world. Um, and, uh, you know, with Mendoza, they promised to send him back to Spain to serve a sentence. They lied. That's the whole thing. Um, and it, it, I've covered his case as well separately. So I just wanted to kind of break down the main points about Yeroshenko's case, because this, again, look at this prisoner transfer. Like, it, it's in the news. Um, here's the headline from CNN. April 28th, just, you know, a few days ago. It's uh, just last week. And when you go down and you read about this case, okay, um, or sorry, about, about uh, the, the prisoner transfer, there's nothing about Yeroshenko's case, okay, they just say prisoner swap for Russian citizen Konstantin Yeroshenko. They don't say anything about him being kidnapped, tortured, nothing. They just say that uh, the Americans just say ultimately those negotiations led the president to have to make a very hard decision with the decision to commute the sentence of Konstantin Yeroshenko, a Russian smuggler convicted of conspiring to import cocaine. <laughs> Yeroshenko is a Russian pilot who had been detained in Liberia by undercover U.S. DEA agents 
on May 28, 2010 and brought to the U.S. He was convicted of drug smuggling and sentenced to 20 years. Uh, again, do you, do you see how they don't mention anywhere that he was kidnapped? Brought to the U.S. No, no, no. He wasn't brought to the U.S. He was kidnapped. You rendered him. Again, let me be very clear. When you extradite someone, that's an official legal process. They didn't extradite him. They snatched him from the street, beat him senseless for days, and flew him to the U.S. illegally. Do you understand? Let's be very clear on that. No one is hiding that. The U.S. does not even deny this. But do you see how the media cover up for them? Can you imagine if, if the Russians had done that to an American? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You, you'd have Lindsey Graham calling for World War III. You know, di God forbid, you know, you, you, you um, accidentally step on an American's foot, you know. But it's okay. Let's just torture Russians and, you know, beat the crap out of them and frame them, whatever. I don't like this double standard. Nobody should be treated like that. American, Russian, or otherwise. Nobody should be treated like that. That's inhumane. It's disgusting. It's unfair. It's unjust. I, I don't understand wh why, why they do this. This is not okay. And I, again, I don't, I don't know much about Trevor Reed's case. Um, uh, he was, I think, they, they alleged that he beat uh, a Russian officer and then they put him in jail, I think, in 2019, something like that. I'm, honestly, man, I have no clue if he got a fair trial. I have no clue if all of that's even true. I'm going to say the same thing Mendoza said. Um, so I'm not trying to say like, oh, the, the, the Russian system is perfect and fair and the U.S. is so evil. No, no, no. I'm saying that what happened to Yershenko is not okay. And I, I don't know what happened to Trevor Reed, but I have, there's an open invitation for him and his family to come on anytime uh, and to just, you know, talk about their experience. So we have both sides because this is right to have both sides of, of this story, even though, again, let's be clear, they're not related to each other. These these cases, they're just they, these guys just happen to be the two prisoners that got swapped. But it's great that they're, they're reu reunited with their families. And because I, I uh, uh, was able to have Yeroshenko on, I'd also like to have uh, uh, Reed on if he wants uh, to talk about what happened. And yeah, in any case, um, this whole kidnapping extradition system is really crazy. And it, it's not surprising if you understand what they did to the people in Guantanamo Bay, for example. Uh, if you've read the WikiLeaks files, how they would you know, just randomly kidnap people and torture them. And then, oh, it's the wrong guy. And just throw him on the side of the street. Like, this is real stuff, right? Khaled al-Masri is one example. And it's thanks to WikiLeaks publishing the evidence of his kidnapping, this torture, that he was able to win in court. He had the files. They see, they did this to me. I have the proof. And they, they, the European Court of Human Rights ruled that Macedonia is uh, liable and that he has to be paid. Uh, again, it doesn't make up for it, but still. A very important. Another reason why WikiLeaks is important. Another reason why this stuff is important to expose this, to show you what's going on um, and uh, what kind of behavior these agents are doing.